Welcome everyone to the Zare Institute for Restorative Justice. My name is Jordan Michelson and I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our webinar today on restorative justice in education. In 2014, a letter was distributed from the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Justice cautioning schools that disparities in discipline statistics based on race, color, or national origin must be addressed in order to help all students succeed and to prevent students getting caught in the school to prison pipeline. Among the rep recommendation for ways to dismantle this pipeline was an emphasis on restorative justice. This is not new data. 30 years of educational research has demonstrated these disparities. However, what is fairly new is research that has shown that when schools implement restorative justice practices, the disparities decrease. Overall, restorative justice reduces the need for exclusionary discipline by addressing the root causes of challenging behavior and by building more just and healthy communities that prevent conflict in the first place. In this five-part webinar series, we hope to highlight some of the good restorative justice work being done in school settings. In the first webinar, Anita Wadwa and five students from a school in Houston shared about their leadership in facilitating circles and helping to address school conflict. Last time, we heard from students in Fairfax County who are part of an honor council at Thomas Jefferson High School. And today, we will hear from two distinguished ed educators and researchers on the importance of building relationships with students and how RJ in education helps teachers to adopt a relational pedagogy. This webinar series is made possible um, partially by coming to the table, an organization affiliated with Eastern Mennonite University. We're grateful for coming to the table and for their work and their support. And now we have a brief film provided by coming to the table that we'd like to share with you now. Coming to the table, a racial reconciliation program affiliated with the Center for Justice and Peace Building at Eastern Mennonite University is pleased to co-sponsor this webinar series on restorative justice in education. Members of Coming to the Table are dedicated to dismantling the so-called school to prison pipeline and strongly support the introduction of restorative justice approaches to school discipline and the creation of healthy school communities as keys to success in this endeavor. Coming to the Table provides leadership, resources, and a supportive environment for all who wish to acknowledge and heal wounds from racism that is rooted in the United States history of slavery. You can learn more at comingtothetable.org. We hope this webinar series inspires many people to find effective ways to take action in your community to build a better world today and for future generations. Great. And with that, I'm going to welcome our facilitator, Kathy Evans, and she's going to bring our guests into the conversation. I will be back later in the webinar to talk about some exciting announcements and what's going on with the Zare Institute. So, Kathy? Thanks, Jordan. So, as was uh, presented in the introduction, we've done two webinars in this series, and both of them have been focused on students' perspective and the way that students have been involved. Today, um, I'm inviting a couple of uh, teacher educators um, and uh, criminologists and uh, people who have been working with teachers uh, to make schools more just and equitable and to build more relational pedagogies. Dorothy Vandering is a professor at Memorial University in Newfoundland, and Brenda Morrison is a professor at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. So they are both Canadians, and um, we've had a lot of conversations about the language of the school to prison pipeline, the cradle to prison pipeline, and while that's not language that's necessarily um, common in Canada, some of the, the same concerns uh, present themselves. And so we will be talking about ways that their work has overlapped with some of the discrepancies in discipline statistics. But mostly we're going to be focusing on um, 
relationships and the importance of relationship building. Um, the title of the webinar today is um, desktop two. Um, is it sharing? It's called, but that teacher doesn't like me. Um, in my own work with uh, students who had been identified as having some emotional challenges, behavioral challenges, I'd often talk to students who would say things like, uh, I would do better in that class, but that teacher doesn't like me. It was never, I don't like that teacher. It was, the teacher doesn't like me. And so I began to realize just the importance of relationships in, uh, in student behaviors and in building learning environments where students are willing to take risks. And so I, I hope that we can focus on, on that today. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about that, mostly about that, but I wanna share also, can you see this? Um, is this showing up, y'all? No. Nope. nope. It's blank screen. Oh, really? Um, well, I'll just explain it. Um, we have a model uh, that we've been working from, imagine a big circle like this, with three smaller circles inside, and those circles are, are the core components of restorative justice in education as we've been uh, working with them. And the first one is, and the one that we're going to focus on today, is building and maintaining healthy relationships. Um, and so I'm going to ask Brenda and Dorothy to talk about their own work. Uh, and Dorothy, we'll start with you. I know that you've done a lot of writing about relational pedagogies. and was wondering if you could just take some time and share with us about how you've been talking about that in your work. Sure. That would be great. Um, thanks, Kathy. Uh, do, do you have some slides? Or yeah. um... OK, so I, I just want to begin by saying that for me, restorative justice has always been connected to relationship and relational pedagogy. Um, my early introduction to restorative justice, though initially it was behavior focused, it quickly shifted as I began to um, employ restorative justice principles in my classroom and also as a parent. Um, ultimately, what happened was I began um, to be able to identify what in my own language was actually quite adversarial and um, then shifting to uh, questions in language that were really about engaging with youth as human beings. Um, my relationship with uh, youth and with other adults changed significantly. And um, I wasn't quite sure what it was in the restorative justice principles and practices that I was using that was actually um, uh, re, um, responsible for that change. And so um, as, I, as my own anxieties in relationship became less and less, um, I began to think about exploring this in research and in uh, graduate work. And so my doctoral work was all about um, the sustainability of restorative justice in school, and it ended up focusing on uh, relational pedagogy. Um, so, so to make a long story short, there were really three key questions that propelled me forward in this way. And if you can go to the second slide there. Um, those three questions I uh, developed as a result of doing some um, very very solid background work in um, taking a look at Zare and Bianchi's foundational philosophies of restorative justice as well as Kay Pranis. Um, and the three of them collectively identified that at its core restorative justice is really about honoring the worth of all people and our interconnectedness. So um, one of the things I began to realize was I had to find a way to reflect critically myself on my own um, language and my own interaction with people as to whether I was actually honoring them and whether I was recognizing the interconnectedness. And so um, in my doctoral work, I, I came up with these three questions um, initially to take a look at schools that were implementing restorative justice, but then more specifically, um, it became very personal. And so um, the question, am I honoring, was really asking the question, 
um, do I see this person that I'm interacting with as an honorable human being or do I want them to be somebody who they aren't? The second question, am I measuring, was um, something that I think is a response to our society um, in terms of individual liberalism somewhat that says, you know, people people have to fit into specific categories. And so in schools, I think we do this in a big way is, um, you know, we categorize students all the time in grade levels and whether they're developmentally ready for this or for that. And so the measuring is actually a synonym for judging, but um, really it's, it's the idea of um, when I look at someone, when I am engaging with a student, uh, regardless of their age, am I measuring who they are to see if they fit my expectations of them or not? And then finally, the third question is, um, when I'm engaging with people, um, I ask myself, as we separate from each other, what message did I leave that person? Did I leave that person with a um, a feeling that they were honored or did I leave them with a feeling that I was actually um, judging them or measuring them to see if they fit into some category that I wanted them to be. So um, since then I've worked with the core beliefs um, that I mentioned earlier and these questions with myself and colleagues and as well as as a teacher educator uh, with what I would say is quite significant success. Several years ago, I took this core idea and I worked to share this with a group of educators in a two-week um, course that was structured around um, the diagram on slide number three, I believe it is, the ripple diagram. And um, this, uh, this institute that I... Um, had designed came out of my graduate work in which um, I was looking at what kinds of um, what kinds of professional development would really be transformative enough for for teachers to understand what the essence of restorative justice was all about. And so at the core of that, if you take a look at the inner circle, um, the inner circle is that core belief um, that people are worthy and interconnected. And from there then, I started to think about, well, what does that mean in terms of my relationship with myself? How do I see myself? Do I see myself as worthy? Do I see myself as connected to others? And then um, moving out from there is, you know, what's my relationship uh, like with other adults? And then moving from there to what's my relationship with myself and students, amongst students, with curriculum and pedagogy and with institutions. So this whole idea of relationship was very integral to all aspects of um, schooling. So um, I, I know that today we're talking about teacher-student relationships specifically, but I'm really quite adamant that if my relationship with myself or with my adult peers and colleagues is uh, not healthy, then my relationship with my students will probably also not be uh, healthy. If I can't actively honor myself um, or other adults in my life, I won't be able to honor my students either. And my students will be able to sense this um, quite quickly too. And it's not like we can be consistent um, completely, but I think for myself, becoming critically aware of my relationship with other people really helped me understand how we were implementing uh, restorative justice in schools as well. So um, my work then is about challenging myself and educators to think about the nuances of how we are when we are together and realizing that this includes everything about how we're communicating, our bo body language, our tone, our environment, and so on, in which as teachers in schools, we actually have significant control over. If you go to the next slide, very quickly, this is a slide that probably um, some of our participants today uh, are quite familiar with. Um, this is a um, this is what I call the relationship window, and it's I've springboarded off of Wachtell and McCold's social discipline window, which um, I feel actually focuses quite heavily on on uh, behavior, and so I wanted to shift. Um, our attention to our relationship uh, with each other in a school setting. And so um, the, 
the axis, the bottom axis, is about how do we support each other. And in brackets there, you'll see how do we support each other for being human. In other words, how do we support each other's worth? And then the side axis is about how do we hold each other accountable for being human, for being worthy and interconnected. And so um, maybe later in this webinar, we'll take a closer look at that. But, but very um, quickly, if I give high support, but low accountability in my relationships, whether that be with adults, with my children, with my students, um, I will tend to do things for them and um, we'll turn them into objects, objects that will uh, primarily um, satisfy my needs rather than uh, looking at their needs. And then uh, likewise, if I uh, provide high accountability but not a lot of support, that's more of the authoritative um, or authoritarian uh, relationship where um, I want somebody to do something uh, for me, uh, so I do something to them, uh, they become objects to be managed. And then um, ultimately, uh, restorative justice, I think, has led me to understand that uh, relationships, healthy relationships, are all about a balance between support and accountability in terms of how we see each other as human beings. And so high support and high accountability then uh, leads to relationships with other people. So, um, yeah, my, my whole journey has been about uh, taking a close look at, at what has happened er in the early days with restorative justice and really recalling and coming back to uh, seeing uh, restorative justice as, as being a philosophy for how we are when we are together. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Brenda, do you want to comment on anything that Dorothy has mentioned? No, I really um, like the development of the relationship window. The, the thing that I think about when I uh, see it is the, um, the work in criminology that looks at desistance and one of the things that, that, uh, that's, uh, that predicts desistance is a good marriage and a good marriage is about high, relation, high accountability and high support. So mm -hmm. I think Dorothy is spot on. Thanks so much, Dorothy. You're welcome. And you too, Kathy. <laughs> And I know, Brenda, that you've done a lot of work with relational pedagogy as well. I'm not sure you use that language. Have you used that language? or? But you've done a lot with relationships, I know, and relationship building. Yes. I use a, the word pedagogy came in later for me. I, um, but it's very important, particularly in the work I do in the, the local schools and in my own work in classrooms. Um, criminology students are typically don't even know the word pedagogy and uh, so I introduce it to them and they they uh, enjoy learning about it um, and uh, but I, I'm a social psychologist and so I I came into the field through the lens of social identity theory so I was studying with people that were um, thinking about a new theory that were relational than past sort of institutional theories of social control rather than social engagement. So I was attracted to the ideas of social identity theory back when I was an educator in outdoor education. And, um, and for me, um, the idea of social identity theory that's important here is the relationship not only from interpersonal relationships, but also the relationship between the individual and the group. And so I became quickly interested in the idea of belonging and the ideas of social identity. When, when I'm identifying with other people in my classroom or any social group and how that then predicts um, my sense of belonging and subsequently my behavior. So behavior is an outcome of social identity processes. So we have to think about those relationship webs earlier rather than later. Um, then, uh, so then I went over and I started working with uh, John and Val Braithwaite, along with Eliza Ahmed, and I got interested in the emotional dynamics of bullying, uh, particularly in the relationship to shame um, as a predictor. And so it's, it's my work in, um, in looking at bullying in schools. Uh, the definition of bullying is the systematic abuse of power 
And what I, through the lens of social identity theory in particular, and if we go to slide four and then five quickly, what it shows is that both uh, young people who are involved in bullying behaviors and those that are at the other end of the bullying behaviors, um, that they're both on a pathway of alienation from their communities, both within the classroom and the school as a whole. And so there's a number of um, behaviors that are related to bullying and victimization in school. But what I'd like to show in particular between slide four and five is that they're both um, on a pathway of alienation uh, characterized in the end by depression and suicidal, ailing, su suicidal ideation. And so one is more characteristics of externalizing behaviors. So the, uh, those involved in, in bullying in school is about um, externalizing behaviors. And that's a lot of learned behaviors because uh, schools are characterized by using a lot of external sanctioning systems to bring about um, compliance, behavioral compliance in many different contexts. So it's not surprising that our students are learning that. Um, victims of bullying um, are caught up in a lot of internalizing. So we have to find the balance between that. And I think the work that Dorothy and I are now doing together on looking at the ecology of relational dynamics really speaks to this. It's not just um, interpersonal relationships, but there's an ecology of relationships that we really need to pay attention to. And if we just skip through quickly the next couple of slides, the work on bullying in school really speaks to this, because right now we think that a particular program is going to be um, uh, addressing bullying in school. And as uh, the work of Maria Toffey and David Farrington at Cambridge shows, and we're looking at slide six right now. It shows that, you know, we have a lot of different interventions that we like to use, that programs hold up um, and addressing bullying in schools. And they threw all the best ones that have been empirically um, uh, examined and looked at the effect size. And if we go to slide eight, it shows that in preventing bullying in schools, um, those are the ones that are most significant. And as Dorothy pointed out, accountability is really important. But look at the other ones. They're also about working together and supporting each other to um, prevent and curb bullying in school. And if we go on to the next slide, slide nine, we can say in terms of preventing victimization in school, again, accountability is central to the mechanism. So, but it's also about support. We need the support of parents and we need peer engagement. And the, the ones that are in red and have the little asterisk beside them, those are the ones that are important to both. So all this together, and we go finally to slide 10, is that um, what David Toffey, or Marie Toffey and David Farrington found is that these intervention programs are a step in the right direction but a lot more work needs to be done. And way back when in 2008, and they've just updated this study, they said we, we need stronger theoretical positions in addressing the problem of bullying and, and as well as the school to prison pipeline, and that they looked at richer theories such as restorative justice. So there's a lot of work that we're doing that's pointing to the direction that restorative justice is an appropriate um, mechanism to be using to looking at the relational ecology of schools and classrooms. Thank you. That's good for now. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Um, Dorothy, do you wanna speak to any of that um, just in response? Um, I think pr primarily, I, yeah, I totally agree with Brenda and really appreciate her bringing forward the idea of belonging. I think that's central to uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing and a lot of the work that I try to help my teacher um, uh, students who are becoming teachers or who are teachers to understand the significance of creating classroom and school cultures 
of belonging and what does that mean and and though we very easily can say um yes you know what that's true for for um, my classroom or our school we work on that all the time uh, again i want to draw attention to the nuances of what kinds of things get in the way of that and how we can't um, how difficult it is to identify that as the adult in the classroom who is really in a power position um, and then the other thing is is just identifying again the significance of the relationship web and how it's it's about the student's relationship to the group as much as it is the relationship to individuals within that group. Um, and then I would go as far as to say as what is um, what what's the relationship between um, the individuals, the group, and their actual environment. Like, what does the classroom look like? How does the classroom encourage uh, interconnectedness and valuing of each other? And how does it actually um, break that down? And what are the different ways that you can you can use to um, encourage relationship? So, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of that, and I, and I really appreciate. Uh, the emphasis, as as so many of us are concerned on with um, bullying, that um, bullying is just the tip of the iceberg. There's something much uh, more profound going on below the surface that I think, as adults, we also are very uh, much a part of and uh, need to recognize. So, what I I hear you saying is that bullying would be almost symptomatic of a degradation of relationships um, and a relational culture within a school. Yes, absolutely. And so, when you talk about ecologies of relationship, um, what I heard just then is it's not just the student's individual relationship to another student or the teacher's individual relationship to the student, but it is a whole web of relationships that. Um, that impact the the culture of that classroom of that community of yeah, learning exactly so what nurtures those relationships and what detracts from it so uh, much of what um the work that i've do, been doing too has to do with um how we can see what goes on in a classroom in a school as being organic right and using the metaphor of of a plant and how do we, what do we do to nurture plants so that they grow? And what kinds of things actually um, starve them or, uh, you know, and, and so um, relationships and people are organic and, and individuals are organic and grow. But I also see um, the interconnected relationships within a classroom and within a school as being very organic as well. And so often we think of schools as being, you know, static square, um, static squares. I'm very conscious of the fact that the sun is coming through my window. <laughs> it's unusual in Newfoundland, so I don't know whether to shut it out or not. Uh, Brenda, can I ask you a follow-up question on one of your slides? So sure. um, I'm actually going to switch to that slide, if, if you don't mind, um, Go ahead. and ask about one of these specific pieces here. Um, on this slide right here, I'm looking at cooperative group work and peer engagement, um, the way kids interact on the playground. And I'm seeing that those things are not just um, like the soft things that happen or don't happen in a classroom, but those are actual pedagogical elements. And I was wondering if we could just talk a little bit about the way that we actually teach, the ways that students, and I mean, the way that teachers actually perform school can impact this relational ecology that we're talking about. Sure. Do you want to, do you have a specific question you want to talk about in term, it, they, those are all pedagogical elements and schools are often set up as, um, as, um, well, I think that there's a, a couple of things that come to mind. One is that, you know, schools tend to be more competitive than cooperative. So mm -hmm. how do we, um, how do we think about cooperative relations? In fact, it, actually, this question in particular goes right back to the core idea of my PhD thesis, which was on how do we shift social 
competition into social cooperation. And one of the, uh, in my literature review, one of the things that I was struck by is that the original definition of cooperative behavior is um, working together. So we have to work together and um, I'm always, when I ever, whenever I say that, I always think about that great um, uh, uh, video by Randy Posh on his last lecture. You know, if we're going to achieve our childhood dreams, which is the topic of his, his uh, last lecture, we have to learn to work and play well with others. And he thinks a lot of us get that wrong. So I would definitely um, encourage you to even watch the Oprah Winfrey version of Randy Posh's last lecture, and that the three components of working and playing well together are the core essence also of restorative justice. And it's about achieving childhood dreams, and that's exactly what we want to be doing in schools. I use it as a pedagogical tool in, uh, in my classrooms all the time, and it really works well for um, young kids all the way up to adults. But um, so back to the definition of competition and cooperation is cooperation was working together and competition was striving together. Hmm. And I think we've forgotten the word, the together part of striving together. And we've, um, we've uh, co-opted it with an institutional context to be a zero sum game. Some people are gonna be a top are going to be the winners and some kids are going to be the losers and we have to reclaim the idea of co competition is striving together to be our best selves so and how do you do that because our institutional culture for generations now and i include myself have been grown have been nurtured with a different model and we have to begin letting that go to understand life is not a zero sum game that we can all strive and be our best together. The other part of that is, is thinking about where the relationships matter and where, where I'm going to show up and where I'm not going to show up. And, um, and uh, the reason why the, the supervision on the playground comes up a lot is that it shows, it, it, it speaks to the idea that context matters, as Dorothy mentioned, that teachers might have a good relationship with their kids in the classroom, but if they don't transfer it on to the, to the playground, where there's a different relational ecology going on, we can't assume that the relationship is still intact. So we need to follow the relational ecology from one part of the, the school into other parts of the school, making sure that that web is intact. Those are two things that come to mind. Good, thank you. Uh, Dorothy, anything about that before we move forward? Um, I, th I think that I, I really like uh, your emphasis, Brenda, on um, well, defining the difference between competition and cooperation, because that's often a sticking point. Um, how do we understand competition? And so forgetting the word together in, um, you know, working together or striving together um, it, to be our best selves, I think is a key piece. So one of the things that I do in my classes all the time, and I would do this at any grade level, at any age level, um, we start off by asking the question, um, what do I need from others to be at my best? and letting students um, uh, just reflect about five things that they need to be at their best in the context of that classroom. And so that really sets the tone for how do we do, how, how do we do being together, right? And so uh, from there, you know, we work out class guidelines and, and those kinds of things, but ultimately always about um, being our best selves um, and recognizing that for me to be my best self, I, um, I contribute a lot to that, but my, um, anybody else who's in that space also uh, uh, nurtures that in me or diminishes that in me. Um, so 
So I think that that's a, um, a key piece. And there was something else that you said at the end, Brenda, I forget what it was now, but the, the idea of zero sum, I, I think um, we've perfected that in schools uh, in, in to, incre to an incredible detriment. It's either we, either students have it or they don't have it. Um, and students really have, um, well, I mean, that's what they're, that's what's being modeled for them. Uh, that's what's being modeled for them. So it's very, uh, very harmful. Anyway, well, I'll think of what it was that you said that, and it'll come back to me. I'm very aware, even as you're saying that, that I have a plant in my office mm -hmm. um, that requires a certain amount of water. Um, and if I water it too much, it does fine. If I don't water house that if I water it too much it will die and if I water it not enough it will be fine and that when you're using a plant metaphor earlier and that what do we need to do to nurture that plant like that's gonna look different for every kiddo um, some kids need a lot of attention some kids really please don't give me a whole lot of attention and I think we have to be really sensitive and have conversations with students so that we can figure that out. If it's a zero sum game where we're treating all of the kids the same and if this one wins, this one loses, and we're trying to do too much of the standardization of, of students, we lose the opportunity, in my opinion, to build on those relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So. And trust needs to be built over time. It's, it's, I, I remember um, one of the first schools that I worked with down in the Australian Capital Territory. Um, the, uh, the teacher was gain, teaching them about belonging and collective responsibility. And there was one, and she used a, a, a circle model to, to gain that sense of belonging. But there was one, and she only invited a certain amount of the class into the, the middle circle and that every some people got to be observers some days and but on a rotational basis people got to be invited into the inner circle and there was one little boy who didn't have a sense of belonging he was caught up that in that anger cycle that creates the alienation and it took him two-thirds of the year to feel he could join the inner circle that it truly was a safe space for him to engage in and be heard and be feel valuable and powerful and needed. It took two thirds of the school year. So we have to honor, my point in saying that is we have to honor where the student's at. And if they're not trusting that environment, there might be very good reasons that they're not trusting that environment. And we have to wait for their lead to tell us that they're ready. In my world, we would call that reciprocity, um, waiting for them to lead out and then following them into spaces that they want to go as learners um creating safe places and i and the whole notion of trust i think is an important part of that um one of the things that i had asked you to think about was exactly what you just did right there is, is share some stories about the importance of building those relationships and i was wondering if maybe we could take a few minutes and just continue that um line of, of thinking and just talk about some examples and some kind of practical stories okay um, maybe it's dorothy's turn okay <laughs> i'll just share a couple stories um some my own and some stories of uh of some of my students um i think in particular of uh, a music teacher who was incredibly um, excited to learn about restorative justice and relational pedagogy and how that might impact her teaching. Uh, music teachers have a difficult time because they transition from class to class. And we had talked a lot about um, check-in circles and the impact a check-in circle can have on teacher-student relationship. And um, one of the, uh, what she discovered, she had been teaching for, um, uh, a number of years already and was getting to a point where she was very frustrated and um, she began using check-in circles and I remember her coming back to class at one point and and um, 
she said, I discovered something. She said, we, we had a check-in circle and I shared with my students that I was, that I am an oboe player in this, in the, um, here. And she realized that in all the years that she had taught, she had never shared that with any of her students. She had never taken her oboe to class to play. And um, because of, I forget what the topic was with the check-in, but suddenly she had an opportunity to share something personal. And that was, um, that was a powerful moment for her because she realized how much she had been holding back, that the things that made her who she was, she had decided somewhere along the line that she shouldn't be sharing that with her students. And I find that too in my uh, in my own teaching, when I have an opportunity, uh, depending on on the, the circumstance and the topic, and we do check in circles with with my adult students as well, is um, they're delighted to find out that my favorite junk food uh, is um, nacho chips, you know, or Dorito chips and uh, ranch flavored Dorito chips, and and it, it's the it's silly little things, but it's it makes uh, a teacher human to her, to her students and especially, or his or her students, and especially at younger grades. I mean, there's a lot of young students who think that their teachers sleep at school. Um, for them to realize that how we are all human beings and we all have these different needs and these different things that, that excite us is really important. Um, I know of schools that have shifted their whole, um, uh, you know, we have these student codes of conduct and um, in introducing restorative justice into their schools and growing into it, they've realized how their student codes of conduct and their student policy documents don't line up with what they're trying to do. And so they've actually revamped their whole policy statements and called them school relational, uh, school relationship policies or things like that. Um, where it's not just about what's expected from the students, but it's about what's expected um, from everybody when they are in the school building. And so that also shows a vulnerability and a, and a willingness to cooperate. Um, uh, just another example with my own students, um, uh, even though I think I might be very clear about assignments or activities that I ask them to do, um, a number of them, uh, you know what, that they, they miss a part of it. And um, a couple of times, you know, they might come to me and say, I don't get this. So I'll explain it again, or I'll give them a handout with steps and say, well, here you go. And then, you know, they'll come back a second or a third time. And it's very easy for me and my busyness to go, you know what, how come they're not getting this? You know, what's wrong with them? Um, <laughs> But if I shift it and I start to ask myself, you know, how can I honor this person mm -hmm. and rather judge it rather than judge them for what they're not getting, but instead honor them. And so then asking the questions or just sitting down and say, well, let's just stop for a minute. Tell me for a moment what's happening for you here. You know, what are you thinking? Like, what's the hardest thing about this for you? And um, it, all of a sudden everything shifts because, because they realize that, I'm interested in them and what the challenge is for them. So, um, yeah, those are a couple of, of examples. Maybe, Brenda, you want to? Those are great examples. There's so many good examples. They, um, I have on, on, on the online course that I teach through, the, through distance learning at Simon Fraser University, I have um, students. Um, uh, they go through an exercise and I've learned about great projects happening around the world from Switzerland to the interior of British Columbia and um, there was one particular student um, who has young children at a school and she went into the school and started just asking lots of questions so I think restorative justice asks starts with asking different questions that just like Howard Zier did 25 years ago, and it's so wonderful that we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of Changing Lenses, and that it, since uh, in that 25 years, the, uh, the paradigm is just gaining more and more strength. So congratulations to Eastern Mennonite University for holding that true for, for, uh, for all of us. Um, 
So asking different questions is really important about relational pedagogy. Institutions tend to ask those three questions that Howard um, pointed out, you know, what rule has been broken or what, yeah, what rule has been broken, who did it and what do they deserve? That's the institutional paradigm of social control or social order. Uh, relational pedagogy is asking different questions. Who has been harmed? What are their needs? And whose obligation is it to stand up? And sometimes it's the institution's obligation to stand up. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the first times that, um, that I observed a restorative justice conference, um, a, young, uh, a young man in school um, had vandalized um, a school quite significantly. Um, the case was diverted to a restorative justice conference. Um, at that time, uh, those conferences were convened by the police officer. Pretty well everyone in that circle wagged their finger at that young boy. What did you do? See how much damage you've done. It's so embarrassing. Um, the cost is astronomical. They were all basically wagging their finger at the young man. And it wasn't until his grandmother spoke that he got the harm caused. Because she, when she was asked, how did this affect you? She told everyone in the circle that first that he loved the boy, that was the support mechanism, but also she didn't understand how he could have done this. And the way that it affected him or her was that uh, she no longer went to her bingo games because everybody in the community knew that was that particular young man that was responsible, but at this point, not accountable for his behavior. And it's the very fact that someone who had a close relationship to him that wasn't wagging their finger at him, that was most able to get through to that little boy or that young man. And, um, and uh, it was the relationship that mattered, that was able to get through to him. And what was remarkable is that everybody in that circle got that he finally got it. Because up to that, he was even proud of his choice to vandalize the school. He had the, yeah, I did it, so what sort of attitude? And it was all over his body. Mm. And everyone knew that he was proud because in his mind, the, world, the, the school had never done the right thing to him. The relationship between that young um, boy and the school was not a healthy one. Mm -hmm. And so um, the young boy finally got it and he made his amends. My question beyond that was like, did the school get it? Why was he, why, why wasn't he feeling valuable and powerful and needed in the first instance? Mm -hmm. Why did he feel that he, that he, he, the choice to vandalize the school was a good one? So I think there's two, two things going on there that he did take, he felt supported and was held accountable for it. But sometimes um, we also have to do things different institutionally and so for me that's the bridge between restorative justice and responsive regulation often we put the onus on the young people to change or the teacher to change and sometimes it's the institutional systems and regulatory structures that need to change because that young man was not feeling valuable powerful needed honored and the school needed to listen to that and take that on board as well thank you we have a question and, and maybe it'll link to, um, maybe we've talked, Brent, uh, Dorothy, you mentioned earlier, and I think Brenda, you've talked about it as well, like uh, circles. And I think a lot of people are, are familiar with circles, but the specific question is, can you explain what a check-in circle is and how do you use circles within a relational pedagogy? Um, and just incidentally, we will, we're about that time. If you do have questions, if, if our viewers have questions, please feel free to uh, 
submit those at the bottom of the screen where it says Q&A. There's a place to type in questions, so uh, feel free to submit those. But anyway, what do we think about um, check-in circles and how are circles used in relational, uh, relational ped pedagogy? Um, just very quickly, um, I use check-in circles, check-up circles, and check-out circles in my classroom. And if possible, I literally put the students in in a circle formation. And if there's a lot of students in the class, I will have them stand along the periphery of the class. Um, and so a check-in circle is just a very light topic. Um, it's something to um, warm us up. It's something to um, recognize who's there today and who's not there today. Um, and so a check-in circle might be a topic like what's your favorite junk food or what did you do last night or um, uh, then we move into metaphors like what color are you today if you were a weather forecast what weather forecast are you if you were a pair of shoes or or footwear what kind of footwear do you feel like today those kinds of things so that they are um, there's no right or wrong answers um, they're they're questions that everybody can answer and um, so they have to be open-ended uh, and light and and the purpose is simply so that everybody has a chance to say something at the beginning of the class um, so they get used to hearing their voice out loud in the context of of a of the classroom and um so that we can get to know each other a little bit better and uh, sometimes uh, the, the questions get a little deeper depending on the size of the class and so on but you know like what's on the top of your mind today and um, that's kind of so that students, when they're coming into the classroom, have a space in which they can say, hey, this is what's going on in my life. And I have had, uh, in, in my adult classes, I have had everything from uh, in one circle of what's on the top of your mind today, just really light things. But within one circle, I had one woman share that she had, had gotten engaged over the weekend. And I had another student in that very same circle share that they had lost a friend in a car accident and it was really interesting there's no comment in a check-in circle no uh, it the you have a talking piece that goes around the circle the person holding the talking piece um, is the one who talks the rest of us listen um, I try to use questions that have a very short answer to them and the idea is is that people don't respond uh, verbally until maybe they're holding the checking piece or till the end when everybody has had an opportunity to share and uh, in that particular incident uh, instance when we had these very contrasting experiences come through um, and I just at the end I said uh, you know is there anybody who wants to say something is there anybody who noticed something um, there were some really profound statements by the rest of the class uh, in terms of empathy for for the, the person who had lost a friend, but also celebration. And the way that that circle could hold both celebration and grief was uh, really profound to me. So um, uh, other than, like that's, that's an example, I, I could give you lots of examples and you can use check-in circles with very young children as, as well. Um, you know, what's your favorite toy? Uh, what, what do you have for lunch today? Um, you know, talk about somebody who's important in your life, those kinds of things. Um, Kay Pranis and Carolyn Boys Watson have just published a book called uh, Circle Forward, which is probably um, the best um, publication around understanding the role of circles and how they can transform relationships within a group and in particular within schools. So for any of our listeners who don't have Circle Forward and are curious about check-in circles, that's uh, one incredible resource that's just been published. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Brenda. Yeah. yeah, and you can find it online through Living Justice Press. So that's the, that's where you find it, and I I second Dorothy's testimonial to circle forward. Um, so I think so. I use check-in circles and circles as part of my classroom practice as well, even at the university level. Um, and the students love it. They said it's the first time that they've felt that connected in a university context. 
Um, universities can be very alienated. Everyone's on an individualized curriculum or plan, and you don't really get a sense of belonging in universities. So um, I would certainly, just as a testimonial to that, the University of Dalhousie Universities in Newfoundland, just below Dorothy, is doing some great work um, uh, building restorative justice into that university culture, both in policy, it's explicit at every level of their policy, but they also have a really amazing um, proactive use of um, the ideas behind restorative justice. In a, in a, in a initiative they have going on right now on creating a culture of belonging at Dalhousie. And I certainly would encourage everyone to go to their website, Culture of Respect, um, and building a culture of belonging there. The, they're, they, um, they're using the pillars of building understanding, uh, learning, creating learning, What's, what, is, what does inclusion mean when we're creating cultures of belonging around curriculum, um, accountability, support, healing mechanisms, which certainly came up in the, uh, the, um, the dentistry, um, the dentistry uh, incident that happened last, uh, or early this year and late last year. But they also talk about the importance of reflection. Mm. And I think all of us educators need to do that more, that, that we need to reflect on our own practice every day and in many different cultures. And I encourage my students to do that. So the way that I use circles um, in my introductory to restorative justice class, we use a textbook by my late colleague, Liz Elliott, called Security with Care. And that's what all institutions are balancing, security and care. And sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we don't get it right. But for each of the chapters in Security with Care, um, together with uh, uh, a graduate student in uh, contemplative studies, we've we've created a series of reflective exercises to take one of the ideas within the chapter and to bring it home into their everyday life. And it's just remarkable what they that they take home these activities. And then what's really important that they reflect on them. So and some of them they can be quite personal in nature and so I don't expect that to be brought up in the circle but I expect them to reflect on what they learned from the, the exercise I've been, <coughs> we've invited them to participate in and those reflections on the exercise is what opens the circle in the two-hour tutorials that we have together and they're really deep and they're touching and we learn a lot about each other and the ideas that are important to the, the course and the concepts that we're studying. So that's another way that I use the circle pedagogy in, uh, in my classrooms. And we also, I'll, I bring in other circle practices. So in, um, uh, there's, uh, the, there's a work called um, the Alternative to Violence Project, which is mostly used in a prison context, but in a school context, there's a, a program called Help Increase the Peace that was developed by um, a group of Quakers um, in, the, in the United States. And so in, in my pedagogy within my tutorials, we do these opening and closing reflective exercises in circle, but they're also interdispersed with um, some of the Help Increase the Peace um, activities and games. And together, they, the students love them, and they're... They, they explicitly tell me that they feel more connected and have a greater sense of belonging within the classroom. Brenda, could you get us a website uh, for both the culture of respect and for help increase the peace and that we could pass that to the participants? Sure. Do you want, is that, do you want me to do it right now? Um, Maybe I don't, we could. I don't know. Okay, I will maybe, try. Maybe we'll send it out. Um, but okay. I think that could be important. Um, uh, you said that there was a web address for culture of respect. Yeah. So if you go to the, if you just go onto a search engine and Google or whatever search engine you use, um, Dalhousie mm -hmm. culture of respect. Great. 
um, or culture of belonging, it'll take you right to that web page at the Del at Dalhousie University. And help increase the peace is invited by is is available through the Quaker group in Washington DC. Thank you. Um, Another resource while we're talking about resources is good. Uh, that I find very helpful is Belinda Hopkins, the restorative classroom right. which oh, yeah. is, is a phenomenal um, resource in terms of balancing, um, you know, theory and explanation with lots and lots of great ideas, very practical ideas for everything from K through adult. Great. Great. We do have one other question um, that popped up just then and, and it'll help us, I think, refocus um, we've talked about relationships broadly and and I'm, i think most educators would say well of course i want to build healthy relationships with students um of course that increases the learning and you know potential of our students of course that creates a, a better environment um but then what about this kid or what about that you know situation and and i think it's when when we have those barriers to healthy relationships where things become um, maybe break down where things become difficult. So you have two students that are constantly fighting with each other. Um, like it's sometimes easier, we think, to just get rid of them because then everybody else will be able to get along and we'll have this beautiful classroom climate if those two students aren't there. Why is that not an okay way to think about things? Other than that we care about those two students. Um, but, you know, there's this one study, Pedro Nagaro talks about interviewing a principal and the principal said, yes, of course, I know that suspension isn't the best thing for this kid, but right now it's the best thing for everybody else. And so, like, how do we balance that out when we start talking about just the pragmatics of a classroom scenario where you've got one or two students that are really disrupting those relationships and, and so can we talk about the role that restorative justice can play in addressing those relational needs and um, even using circles to talk about harm or to talk about conflict or, you know, how does, how does restorative justice begin to address relationships when things get complicated? Well, I, th I think if we go back to um, thinking about uh, the importance, like we uh, again, we we might want to focus on what's what's the problem between those two kids, right? That just are forever at each other. Um, I think it's really important to to see what's going on in the context of that classroom or that culture, or even perhaps in in terms of their own lives. And I think of a story where um, you know two kids were always at each other, and and the guidance counselor in the school. Um, uh, was getting really tired of this and it actually erupted so that um, they knew that even outside when the parents came to pick them up, pick up the kids, the parents were at each other um, and trying to defend their own children and, and so on and so forth. And so it became really quite ugly. And, and this, um, this uh, counselor said, you know, he had never felt so nervous about doing anything, but what he did is he actually brought rather than bringing the children together, he brought the parents together because the parents were having these altercations on school property as well. And um, after a, a dialogue in which, you know, they were able to share what was happening and what they were thinking and feeling and, and so on and so forth, and what was the hardest thing for them, what they needed to be at their best, um, they were able to resolve their differences and see what was going on. And the really profound thing was that, um, after that, the students had no problem, right? And, and they didn't see those children in the um, administrator's office again for the rest of the year. And I, I think that really points to the fact that a lot of times, as Brenda, you said too, our, our tendency is to um, imagine that the institution itself doesn't, is not responsible for uh, triggering some of this yeah. behavior in students and that's not to let students off the hook and say well you know what they're they're um 
uh, subject of their environments and so on and so forth. I mean, students have to be held accountable. But I think we really have to explore for our students um, when we have this recurring um, behavioral issues and, and dissatisfaction and so on, is to find out from them, you know, what is really happening for you? You know, what's going on here? Um, is, is, do they not feel safe in the classroom? Is there something that I'm doing, even with all my good intentions to have a good relationship, is there something about me that's triggering something in them that's making them feel unsafe and they're actually taking it out on another student? You know, like, I mean, that's part of that, that ecology and that interconnectedness. And the only way that you can find that out is if you can create a safe enough space for students to actually share um, share these things. And whether that be in a small circle with two or three or four uh, people. Um, and I use a question framework that, um, that helps me guide that dialogue. Uh, besides, am I honoring, am I measuring? And that's basically, you know, what's happening? What are you thinking and feeling? What's the hardest thing for you? What impact is this having? You know, what do you need to move forward? So I use those, those questions, but, um, again, I, I would say we have to recognize that as adults, we can be um, a part of the solution as much as thinking that the, the children themselves have to change. I don't know. Brenda? Um, in terms of the, those, those two kids or one kid or those kids, <laughs> those bad apples that are disrupting everybody else's learning, I think it's important to pay attention to a number of things because um, often we pay attention to the, the bad apples and we think that excluding those bad apples is going to take care of the problem. And often that's just a band-aid solution to a deeper problem. And so we have to be willing to open up our, um, our heads and our hearts to delve deeper into those typically band-aid solutions where we expel or exclude the bad apple. And that's a culture that we're, that we, that is ingrained in us. It's certainly, we see it characterized through the school to prison pipeline that getting rid of the bad apples creates better learning environments for those they leave behind. But I don't know if that's necessarily the case. And, um, and when I, when you think about the power dynamics that, that are involved in um, when we exclude children from class, their learning community, which is their classroom. So, it, and it really speaks to the idea of power. So if there's two bad apples, so to speak, in the classroom, what the person that has the power in the classroom, that's the teacher, does, is typically they just wanna get on with their, their lesson plan, which is fine. Um, but if, what they do then is they send the problem and the person out the door, down the hall, to the next person in the power hierarchy that's holding up the institution. And there's a problem there. Children, both the so-called bad apples and everyone else, is learning a lot in that dynamic. Mm -hmm. They're learning that when things get tough, we just push people up that power hierarchy. But more importantly, the kids left behind in the, pro in the classroom, and if we think of it as a small learning community, what they're learning is when things get tough, we don't take care of the problem. Mm -hmm. Other people take care of the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's how we've raised a culture of passive bystanders. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the Dalai Lama said when he, when number of people, uh, it was about 10 years ago, our greatest threat to humanity. Some people answered terrorism at the time, and the Dalai Lama answered, we've raised a generation, if not generations, of passive bystanders. And we have to ask, by what mechanism have we done this? And, and that's an important question for every institution to ask themselves. Mm -hmm in terms of curbing the school to prison pipeline or um, building a culture of upstanders opposed to bystanders. Because the research in addressing bullying in schools 
you know, when we when we started the research, we were putting a lot of focus on the, the young people involved in the bullying behavior or the victims. And now we know that the thing that's changing the culture in classrooms is enabling upstanders mm -hmm. and leaving bystanders, um, um, you know, leaving the, the culture or leaving behind the idea that passive bystanders is okay. That we need to create upstanders and um, we need to pay attention to those power dynamics that institutions are promoting and that we can do a lot of work in classrooms that create that sense of collective responsibility and accountability to each other as learning communities. And sometimes you might have to send a couple of young people away and, and some, they're, 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 um, they're, the, the rooms aren't detention rooms anymore. Schools are you know, calling them time ins rather than time outs, but it's, it's a time in on focusing on a particular behavior that they need to focus on with each other and, and they have someone there facilitating that. But it's also how you welcome them back into the classroom and rebuild those relationships that's important. Right. So I'm thinking about Dorothy's three questions here. Am I honoring, am I measuring, and what message am I sending? And so just then what you were talking about is when we exclude students from class because of behaviors that they're exhibiting, when we, when we send them away, we send a message that you're not honorable, that you're not worth my time. And that doesn't just send that message to those students who have been suspended, but it sends that message to every other student in that classroom that says, this is not a safe place for me to interact. This is not a safe place. I also am, am at risk of being sent away if I do anything wrong or um, just I'm not valuable. I'm not worthwhile. Um, yeah, and, that we have disposable kids. Yeah. And I hope that I'm not one of them. Right, exactly. And so we, we create really unsafe learning environments where kids may not participate, may not engage, even with learning, much less socially. And um, so, yeah, back to Pedro Nogueiro, in that same research, um, that school actually created a room, a classroom for all the bad apples. Um, and what they found was even when you got rid of all the bad kids out of each class, the, the behavior problem still continued in the classrooms, even without those students, because the problem wasn't the students. It was that environmental ecology that you're talking about, the relational ecology that was not in place. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so there's a question here. And I think we've responded, but let's just make sure that we don't miss it. So do you not send those students to the principal? What should the teacher do when that does happen? And you mentioned, um, I think the word that we would use here a lot would be in school suspension. So a room where we would send students and a lot of those are also exclusionary by nature. And they also would keep people from staying up on on their learning environment the, you know keeping up with content so i'm not sure that an in-school suspension is necessarily any better an option um but but what should should teachers do when you have students that are having those chronic um challenging behaviors well i, th I think there's a lot of different ways and different schools are, are doing different things and it's a complicated question um, where the answer is complicated. It, it was a student uh, who recently pointed this out to me. Um, she's, she was commenting on the word suspension. Mm. Like when we suspend somebody, what do we do? We, we, you know, what does the word suspend mean? And this is what I mean too by, you know, what messages are we sending to our students when we use even words like you know, you're being suspended. Well, you you suspend things in midair. They have no place, no place to belong. We take them out of their social circles. We take them out of their connected spots. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, schools are changing their suspension rooms or their uh, detention rooms. There's another word, detention, right? Like, oh my goodness, what does that actually mean? And And they become just, sounds when actually they carry meaning and they carry meaning that um, 
we can't always control how students are perceiving what that means to them. And so we have, um, you know, we have schools that have started setting up circle rooms or um, dialogue rooms or, um, you know, and, and often it, that does not, like restorative justice doesn't mean that there is no suspensions um, or we, let me say it this way, restorative justice does not mean that students never have to go home or go to another place than their classroom, especially if, if they are causing harm and that harm, we're not able to stop that harm from happening. You know, our first responsibility is to make sure that there is no more harm happening. Um, but like Brenda said too, it, it's, it's all about what happens when that child is removed from the situation. What happens to the students that are left behind? Do we take time to explain to them what's going on, what's happening? Maybe not right in the moment, but later on. How do we reintegrate students back into the classroom once they are suspended and they come back into school? Oftentimes, you know, they, we just expect them to come back in. Maybe they had to have a conversation with the principal and the teacher, but we rarely expect that they will have, they will have had a conversation with their classmates. And this is where, you know, circles that are facilitated properly, especially when a student has to leave a class because of harm done to the rest of the class, that, you know, a, a full class circle, if a school is used to a relational ecology, is just part of the norm, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, uh, rooms where students can go to debrief and dialogue, that those are really important spaces to have. Um, but we have to be careful that we just haven't renamed the space. And like Brenda mentioned that too in the circle with the youth who had, um, who had vandalized and everybody was pointing their finger at him. You know, when that happens in a circle, um, we have to ask ourselves, how is that circle being facilitated for that to actually be happening? Because those participants who are in power positions can't wait to get into the circle so they can set this kid straight. Well, those circles end up doing often a whole lot more damage. So we, we have to be very careful when we're using restorative justice pedagogy and, and practices that we actually do test all the time what message are we actually sending and actually asking the students you know what do you think you know asking students what they think you are doing as a teacher what message are they getting from you and it's often quite surprising what you think you're doing and what the students perceive you're doing are two very different things so i i think it's um, um it's a complicated question Yes, students need to be removed from classrooms at times. Um, but it's what we do with those students when they are out of the classroom and how we bring them back in. You know, and I recall uh, early on in my career too, I would ask students to, you know, stand in the hallway if I could trust that they wouldn't run away or that kind of thing. And I don't know that you can actually do that anymore. But, but it was always with the invitation for them to come back. You know, it was always with saying, you know what, you're a valued member of this community. We, we need you back. Um, but it seems like you need, you need to take a deep breath. So when you're ready, come on back because we want you back. Rather than a message that says, if you can't go by the class guidelines, you don't belong here. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, we have to send that message that says, you are part of the class. Okay, what can we do to help you um, thrive within this space? So some of the things that come to mind for me is that, that Dorsey spoke of is, is that we're all reflective practitioners. How, and in particular, we have to think about how am I using my power and whose needs am I upholding in whatever, uh, intervention I'm using, whether you're sitting in a circle or even in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Thinking about the dynamics of power and whose needs I'm serving, and often we default to serving the needs of the institution. Mm -hmm. And we need to really 
rethink that if we keep on, because it's, we, we carry out this march of folly again and again and again, if we keep on serving institutional needs. And institutions by design were, um, they're, they're, they're created in the age of reason. They were created with strong institutions at the helm. We we're supposed to um, work against human tyranny because we didn't, at that time, we didn't see the human good in people. We saw the human, you know, um, retributive side or the greedy side. But we know now that humans, you know, there's a yin and a yang to all of us. And if we create institutions uh, just on one side of that yin and yang of social life, and we don't uphold the fact that people are hardwired to do the right things under the right circumstances, taking care of the context, we act the, the research on compassion shows that we act in the common good when we trust that we're in a safe place and that we feel valued and powerful needed. And our institutions are sometimes give us a different message. And if we start shifting that institutional culture, I think we can take a long, a, 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 a huge step forward. And principles are a really important part of this relational ecology. Because there, you know, there's the principle that uses the institutional mandate. So when the young person ends up in front of them, they could just open up the student code of conduct and said, "What do you do?" The pink slip you said you dishonored the teacher, you disrespected the teacher, and so for that, for that transgression, you get 30 minutes after school. I mean, that's sort of the the early, the early. That's the you know, that's the one step before we get to a criminal code. It's our early criminal code that we're institutionalizing our young people. So we have to think about those dynamics. Or the principal could say, you did X, and our policy sa says that that's, you know, we think of that as a severe transgression. But what do I need to do with that from a relational point of view? And in my experience, if the principal isn't on board, it's going to be a, a long road ahead in creating a, a sustainable culture um, in this paradigm shift that's moving from institutional control to a relational pedagogy. The principle is vital and how the principle manages the situation and asks who needs to be there. It's that idea that asking different questions and sometimes, oh, it's, I, in this situation, I just need, it just needs a conversation between those two young boys, because I know I know those two young boys, and I think we can work it out. Or it might be bringing in a professional, bringing in the parents. Parents are really important to bring on board. Sometimes it's the parents that are escalating the conflict rather than the young people themselves. Mm -hmm. um, we are nearing the end of our time. I was wondering if uh, we could maybe just provide one or two maybe two or three brief uh, concrete ideas for building healthy relationships. Like the one that comes to my mind, like remember your students' names. I, I remember a story about a kiddo who had a, a, a name that was difficult to pronounce. He was from, I don't remember, but and, and people would never pronounce his name right. And he appreciated me as his teacher because I pronounced his name correctly. I mean, like, but just some concrete things. Um, because I think one of the questions here is, you know, when we talk about relationships with students, we're not talking about being best friends with them, but we're talking about doing specific things to make them feel valuable and a part of our learning community. So what are some of the maybe more concrete things that we might do to establish those kinds of healthy relationships or not just between us and students, but those relational ecologies that we're talking about? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know where well, <laughs> I mean, I'll just do, I'll name three. One is I always encourage uh, anybody starting this practice just start with a simple circle that allows people to have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that um, Kay Prana says, and I quote a lot, is yeah. that, and it relates back to this idea of power. It's, she says that. Um, 
The number of people that listen respectfully to my story is a function of power in our culture. So the powerful people get to tell lots of stories and have lots of people listen. Hmm. Subsequently, listening to someone's story is a way of validating their intrinsic self-worth, that they feel valuable and powerful and needed. So I would encourage everyone to sit in circle and listen to each other's story, validating their intrinsic um, worth and to... Um, so we can all in some way hold each other up and recognize each other's gifts because some kids are great at the traditional three R's of school, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, but I will say Howard Zier's three R's are equally important. Creating a culture of respect, creating a culture of responsibility, and creating a relational um, culture so um so in an elementary school one of my one of the students in uh up in nelson uh british columbia she uh, they used a storybook about filling up each other's buckets because mm -hmm. buckets are about as one young young girl and her her um research said you know you can fill up your bucket with belonging and power and stuff and my job in school is to fill up each other's buckets. So in a, liter in a literature, in, when you're reading to young people, take a good story and, and use it as a pedagogical tool to develop those three R's. And so she, the teacher is, um, how are we filling up each other's buckets today? And so they're doing check-in circles and, you know, how, how full is your bucket in terms of respect? How full is your bucket in terms of responsibility? How full is your bucket in terms of relationships? And we can check in with each other just how full my bucket is. And kids are really honest. I learned that a long time ago, that kids love this and they get it, typically faster than the adults. We, we grew up in an old story and we have to work hard at letting that story go. So using circles in simple ways is a good way and just, always thinking about those other three R's that complement um, the traditional three R's of education. Thanks, Brenda. Dorothy, do you want to close us out with a couple of practical things? Well, um, yeah, I just noticed that my power is just about gone and I didn't have my computer plugged in, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I, the key thing is learning to listen. Learning to listen and learning to ask. So, um, and that kind of uh, just follows me around. How can I create spaces of belonging? How can I create spaces of listening? So everything from, uh, you know, when I, when I can have my act together before I come into the classroom, that I can actually stand at the door and welcome each of the students by name. That is so important. Um, I do really think the um, check-in circle, I, I often want to do a check-in and a check-out where everybody leaves and talks about one thing they're going away with or one thing that, that struck them that day. Though I don't always have time for the check-out, the check-in has profoundly changed the classroom. I have students as adults who say that in my class, it's the first time in their life that they have said something out loud in a class. Hmm. Um, they, have, they have literally never had the courage to speak aloud in the class. And the check-in circle has helped them get over that. Um, I have a, uh, a teacher friend who has developed caring harm awareness talks, which um, she called, which is a chat. So she will say to people, uh, to her students or to her colleagues, you know, let's have a chat about that. And it's about, um, you know, using again those questions, what's happening? What are you thinking and feeling? What's the hardest thing? Um, what do you need to move forward? Um, it, it's about becoming aware of not just the harm that you caused me, but realizing that that we have we are in some kind of dilemma and we're causing each other harm. So, uh, so being fully aware of learning how to listen better because we uh, are in a culture where we are not listening. And I want to pull back to the school to prison pipeline. And you're right, we don't talk about that a whole lot in Canada, but it's alive and well here as well. Um, you know, our prisons are filled with, with people with mental illnesses and 
and um, you know visible minorities and so on and so forth is but but you know what they they haven't been listened to nobody's taken the time to listen to them from the time when they were very young you know their social capital is so diminished and and as a teacher you have such incredible power to um just wrap your arms around them and say you are important to me so trying to find every which way to say you are important and you matter and you are connected um, and I don't know of any better way to do that than through circles of various kinds. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Dorothy Vandering, Brenda Morrison, I appreciate you joining us today. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Jordan. Um, there's still a couple of questions that are unanswered. Um, I will answer those via text um, while Jordan is uh, doing some closing remarks and then we'll come back and summarize things. Thanks so much, Jordan. Yes, yeah, thank you so much, both Brenda and, and Dorothy, for that wonderful conversation. I, I felt that the stories um, and personal experiences that you shared were, were very, very powerful. Um, I'm Jordan Michelson. I'm currently a graduate student at the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and I work as a graduate assistant to the Zare Institute for Restorative Justice. And I'm just going to quickly go through a couple of announcements regarding the Zare Institute and upcoming events, uh, future ways to stay engaged in these conversations, and other things that are happening here in, in Harrisonburg and on the web. We are in the midst of a five-part series on restorative justice in education. Our next webinar will be taking place in July. We still have yet to arrange the exact date and time, so please stay tuned for that. You can also view previous recordings uh, of these webinars online at our website. A little bit more about the Zare Institute um, for Restorative Justice and EMU. Uh, the Zare Institute is part of the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding at Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. EMU offers undergraduate degrees and several graduate programs such as the Masters in Conflict Transformation, Business Administration, Counseling, Biomedicine and Education. EMU also has a full seminary program and is the host of the Summer Peace Building Institute. And you can learn more about our programs on the web at emu.edu. The Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience is a research-based trauma awareness and resilience training program that began in 2001. And STAR training brings together theory and practices from neurobiology, conflict transformation, human security, spirituality, and restorative justice to address the needs of trauma-impacted individuals and communities. And this program is really great for individuals and organizations whose work brings them into contact with populations dealing with current or historic trauma. And as you can see on this slide, there are several opportunities to receive STAR training at both the level one uh, and level two training. Um, and you can check out more opportunities on our website at EMU. Uh, as I mentioned, the Masters in Conflict Transformation program here at the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding is a practice-based curriculum, and it's rooted in the belief that in addition to being equipped with tools for analysis and theory for understanding conflict on the personal, community, and, and global levels, Practitioners must be committed to critical self-evaluation and personal reflection. Um, it's, those, those values are, are very much a part of the curriculum here. And, and uh, yeah, EMU does a great job of preparing practitioners to be reflective in the field. In addition to the MA program, there's also a graduate certificate that is offered in restorative justice uh, this is great for those who are working professionals and maybe want to brush up some skills in restorative justice or go deeper with some of the theory and knowledge and, and information about what is happening in the field of restorative justice. I know that this last year we offered at least one course uh, online that enabled people to engage in distance learning. Uh, it was a great way for, for some people that are outside of Harrisonburg to be part of the course and to be part of the, part of the um, certificate program. We are currently also 
um, pleased to offer a restorative justice in education program, a full master's uh, through the master's in education program, and also a restorative justice in education certificate. Uh, so there are many opportunities to go deeper with this material, learn more about the theory and the practice uh, of, the, of these concepts and these values. Uh, so I would encourage you to check out the website at emu.edu and, and search for Masters in Education and Restorative Justice. And with that, I'd like to thank our panelists once again, and I'll hand it back over to Kathy. Thanks, Jordan. I do appreciate Dorothy and Brenda joining us today and this important conversation about building relational pedagogies. Um, I think it is a core uh, part of restorative justice and I think that there are some of the restorative justice practices and processes that facilitate those kinds of relationship building and so I hope um, that you'll continue to research and to read and to think about how we can do um, a better job at building those those healthy relationships particularly particularly with those students who, who challenge us a little bit sometimes. Um, and uh, we will continue this series. We have two more webinars. Um, I, I'm not sure, Jordan, that the next one will be um, in uh, July. It might be in August, but uh, we will definitely be posting that and sending out word on that. So thank you so much for joining us today or by uh, looking at this later on at your convenience. Either way, however you've done that. So thank you so much. We're glad to have you.